All right, so that's the salt of the earth. What about the light of the world? Well, this one's a little easier to understand, especially if you know the Old Testament prophets. If you go back, for example, to the prophet Isaiah, on a number of occasions, in Isaiah chapter 42 uh, and Isaiah chapter 49, uh, the prophet describes Israel as being called by God to be a, quote, light to the nations. Um, and this image here is of Israel shining the light of truth, shining the light of the covenant, uh, shining the light of the law upon the darkness of the many nations, the Gentile nations of the world, who were caught in not just immorality, uh, but idolatry and a general ignorance of the ways of God, uh, of the revelation of God, of the law of God, of the worship of God. And so Israel's vocation wasn't simply to be the chosen people of God as if Israel was chosen and the Gentiles were rejected. No, Israel was chosen by God for the salvation of the world. Um, like in the book of Exodus chapter 19, God says, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. Uh, and in, in Exodus 4, he says, Israel is my firstborn son. What does that mean? Well, it means that Israel's the firstborn son, uh, but the rest of the Gentiles are like the second and thirdborn. They're the younger sons in the family of God. And Israel's vocation is to be the example, to be the shining light, to be a light to the nations. So in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is doing is basically revealing to the disciples you are the new Israel. You are the true Israel of God, and I'm calling you to be a light, not just to the nations, but to be the light of the world. Now, if you have any doubts about that, the image of a city set on a hill uh, confirms it. Because if you look in the, again, the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, or chapter 60, or Micah 4, um, the new Jerusalem, spoken of by the prophets, this great and glorious city of Jerusalem, that would come about in the new creation and the new heavens and the new earth is often described as being raised up at the top of the mountain, as set upon a great mountain, the highest of all the mountains of the earth. So the city set on a hill is an image of the new Jerusalem. So the disciples here are called to be the new Israel and to be a new Jerusalem. And just like uh, Israel was called to be a light to the world, Jesus is basically saying to them that they are going to be the example that leads the nations, the Gentile nations, to right worship, to true faith in God, and to the new law of the gospel. Now, with that said, those Old Testament allusions out of the way, Jesus uses what appears to be a somewhat more mundane example. He just basically uses an image of a household lamp, right? So he's, he's describing here probably a small wicker oil lamp that was common at the time, which people would, you know, put up in a house on a lampstand to give light to the house in darkness. Well, he, Jesus says here, no one lights a lamp and then sticks it under a bushel basket, right? I mean, that would defeat the purpose. Uh, just like salt without flavor def defeats the purpose of even using salt, a light under a bushel uh, basket defeats the whole purpose. So their task as being the light of the world is to let their light shine before others, right? How do they do this? Notice something very interesting here in verse 16. Jesus says, let your light shine before men so that they may see what? What exactly is it that the disciples are called to shine before others? Jesus is very explicit here. It's their good works. Uh, the Greek word here is kala erga, uh, very explicit, good works. Um, why do I emphasize that? Well, because in some Christian traditions, there's a rejection of the idea that works have any value whatsoever. Uh, the idea, going back to Martin Luther, was saved by faith alone, and works don't, don't have any importance whatsoever. You definitely don't see that kind of theology in the, in the Gospels when you look at Jesus. Jesus is very often emphasizing the critical role that good works are going to play, uh, not just in the salvation of an individual person's soul, but in the salvation of the world. So he's saying the good works of his disciples are precisely the visible means that are going to draw other people into the kingdom, into the kingdom of God. And the goal of performing these good works, he makes clear here, is not so that uh, each individual person would get glory, but so that God the Father might be glorified. So there's no tension here between this statement, as we'll see and later in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus will say, don't perform your good works so that others may see them, you know, but do it in secret. 
well, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, but there he's going to be talking about particular works of piety uh, that people can be tempted to do in order to get others to think that they're holy. Uh, that's going to be a danger he'll address. But right here, he's just talking about what we would call evangelization, bearing witness to the whole world the tr about the truth of the good news, about the truth of the gospel, and the new law of Christ. By living the new law of Christ that he's giving in the Sermon on the Mount, they will bring about the salvation that the prophets spoke of in the book of Isaiah and the rest of the Old Testament. Right? Okay. Oh, and another thing, by the way. Um, someone might say, well, wait a second, there's a contradiction here. Because in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Chapter 8, verse 12. So, is Jesus the light of the world? Or are the disciples the light of the world? And the answer is, yes. It's both. Uh, it's a both and. Classic Catholic both and. It's not that Jesus is the light or we're the light. It's both. Because the light that the disciples are going to shine in the world only comes through their union with and imitation of Jesus. He's the source of all of the light of the gospel, but it's going to shine through his disciples and out into the world because of them.